Hi, everyone, and welcome to the 21st chance talk that Sam Savage and I are doing on a bi weekly basis. Uh, we share the latest news in risk management, latest developments, models, technologies, and just bright ideas about integrating risk, man risk analysis into uh, decision making. Sam, thank you well, for joining me. It's been a while since we last uh, chatted. H how are you? I'm good. I'm good. And I hope we're sharing bright ideas. I... <laughs> Well, I can I can assure you of that. That's literally the easiest part because yeah. some of the things that you've been talking for the last uh, five or six years now are still groundbreaking today. I'm just kind of I'm waiting for it became to become mainstream. And by the way, everyone, we are live. Um, so if you're watching on Facebook, YouTube, or LinkedIn or Twitter, you can ask uh, questions. Type in the questions and we'll see them and then we'll respond to the questions. As we go along, and just you know, just say hello and write where you're watching from. Yeah. Hey, you know what? We always have to do something on current events, and I realize um, that the current event that caught my eye is that suddenly people like Elon Musk and Steve Wozniak, <clears throat> who helped create Apple, are saying, "Oh, we got to put a pause on AI development." Um, my degree is in computational complexity. The horses left this barn decades and decades ago. Alan Turing created the, the Turing test in 1950. It said, you know, the Turing test is, can a machine impersonate a person so that you couldn't tell the difference, right? Mm. And then there was a movie in 1968, the 2001 Space Odyssey. And... Uh, there was a computer on board that tried to take over the mission and they had to shut it down. Okay. Um, so how can people be talking about this now? I mean, it's, it, it's, it's absurd that the, now, now we did pretty well with nuclear proliferation because if you build a <clears throat> uranium enriching centrifuge in your garage, someone is going to notice because they're huge. Yeah. But if your teenager is cranking out AI <clears throat> on on their gaming machine in the basement, who's going to know? So anyway, <clears throat> and, and the other current event you you you've just published a very nice article on the Silicon Valley Bank situation. So for, help help, yeah. help help listeners find that bank yeah. uh, find that article. Yes, yes. So if <clears throat> well, actually. If, if you go to my LinkedIn page, I've linked to several of them because one article was done by Matthew Rafelson, who is our chair of financial applications. Mm -hmm. Another article was done by me and Matthew, but headed up by Shane Cavanaugh at the Government Finance Officers Association. And I think the really short version of Silicon Valley Bank is this. The, the reason there are banks is the central limit theorem. That is a million people put one dollar in the bank. Now the bank has a million dollars. Those people take the money out randomly, but they mostly leave it in the bank. The chance that all million people will take their dollars out at once is uh, just negligible. So in fact, the bank only has to keep 100,000 in the bank to cover that because of the central limit theorem. And then that means they invest the other 900,000, make money on it. Okay, here's another bank. Instead of a million customers with a dollar each, they have one customer with a million dollars. That doesn't work because the one customer takes their money out, they need all their money. The bank can't go invest that. So there was a double whammy at Silicon Valley Bank. The first whammy was that where they had vest, invested all their money was in long-term bonds whose value decreased when the Fed started cranking up interest rates. And that's okay. They could have survived that. But the other problem was, and this was exacerbated, they did not have a very diversified clientele. Their clientele were all these ultra-rich venture capital guys, and they were also storing their money in the same sorts of investments that the bank was to an extent, which meant that when the bank's 
value went down, all these folks had to grab their money out of the bank to cover their own needs. And worse than that, but they were all Twitterites and they started sending out tweets, get your money out quick, get your money out quick. So it all came out at once and that was, that's all she wrote. How, how endemic this is, I mean, we know there are other issues because of interest rates going up. And I mean, hey, you, you're in Switzerland now. Well, how about uh, the huge Swiss bank that went under? That's a surprise. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But, you know, I, I think we should talk about some some work that I'm doing with a couple folks from our organization uh-huh. on, I think I'm going to call it modular risk management, mm-hmm. right? And what do I mean by modular? By modular, I mean you can do the pieces separately and then put them together like Lego blocks. Oh, no, that's what we'll call it. We'll call it Legoland. Yeah. <laughs> Le- Lego Sip. Actually, well, those Sips are the Lego blocks. Uh, yeah. Now, hold on. Wait, maybe maybe I should start with, with that slide, actually. Let, that's just a minute. Let sure. me share a slide. So sure. this is and really... I'll, I'll say hello to Nada and Simon who, who are watching us and uh, other guys from LinkedIn. Say hello as well. Don't be shy. Okay. So I'm ready, I, I'm ready to share my first slide here. Perfect. Let's have a look. So, so we will call this fair in Legoland. Um, I went out and actually bought a Lego font so I could type fair in a Lego font. Um, and this work is done with with John Button and Eng Wee Yo. They are um, both uh, volunteers of the nonprofit. So Eng Wee Yo uh, is assistant director of factor analysis of information risk, FAIR, which if you haven't heard about it, we are going to define it. And John Button is our chair of risk strategy. And uh, I'm sure that somewhere on, on Chance Talk, we've talked about the difference between sandcastles and Lego blocks, no doubt. We have briefly, yes. 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 And, and what is the issue here? Um, the issue is that you can add up averages, but averages alone are not risk. Risk involves not just the average, but things off in the tails of the distribution. And uh, SIPs let you add up the entire distribution. So let me switch now to another uh, slide. I think I can, I don't mind having people see what's going on underneath there. Okay. So, so let's talk about standards for risk management. And the American Society of Mechanical Engineers um, has this flawed definition of risk. Risk is the likelihood of failure, LOF times the consequence of failure. And this I know you've heard from me. This was taken from like safety risk of gas pipes, right? Mm-hmm. But it's a very mm-hmm. standard definition. I know yep, you've heard very- yeah, it's always likelihood times consequences. Exactly. What, what one kind of type of likelihood and why type, one type of consequence? Always something. It, 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 exactly. And and so, for example, one chance in 10 of killing someone is 0.1 fatalities. One chance in 80 billion of killing everyone on Earth is 0.1 fatalities. But no one can consider those the same risk. And yet they are boiled down to the same risk. And worse than that, or no, I mean, just as bad, I mean, just all part of the same garbage, yeah. is that you have no estimate of the likelihood of simultaneous failures due to interdependencies. Mm. And I call that LOSF. Yeah. So, so I like to think of um, 
establishing risk standards, people are beginning to do it. And notably, FAIR, the factor analysis of information risk created by Jack Jones, you know, this is this represents a a good step, but but what kind of step is it really? So so let's talk about a uniform methodology here. You've got formats, computations, and representations. This sounds very uh, academic and dry. So let's make that more concrete. And let me do it in terms not of risk management standards, mm -hmm. but accounting standards. So we're going to decide how to do our financial statements. Mm -hmm. right? Formatting. Well, you can look at all these. And by the way, people love starting here. We're going to do our financial statements. Um, Oh, God, I love the one with the green stripe. Let's go with that. And then there's a board meeting. And OK, we're going to go. <laughs> yep. This is not very important in the overall scheme of things. All right. That's the least important. Oh, it's where people focus, though, because it's the easiest to do. OK. Um, now let's talk about computations. These are things like profit equals revenue minus cost. Retained earnings is profit minus dividends. Uh, and the, these are extremely important. Uh, oh, asset turnover is revenue over assets. I don't know what these are. Anyway, they're more important than the format, I promise you. Mm -hmm. Before I get to rep representations, this is where FAIR fits. So, I mean, FAIR lays out this pathway for us. What FAIR does not include, and by the way, that is phenomenal. It's, it's sort of like um, providing the situational awareness, right? Okay, but more important are representations. And what do I mean by that? Well, look at all the ways we could represent numbers. Mm-hmm. And it turns out this is the way we're communicating profit and we're, we're not communicating profit in Roman. We're not, yeah, profit in Roman numerals and, you know, costs are in these little, these little things up here with, uh, you know, those things. We're not, mm -hmm. no, no, we've actually settled and we did this a long time ago. We settled on Hindu Arabic numerals. That was not an easy thing to do. And, and I'm sure you've heard me rant and rave about how, you know, Fibonacci brought these things to Italy in 1199. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he said, I got this because he'd studied with the Arabs in Algeria, right? And so, you know, he's saying, I got this great new way to communicate and calculate numbers. And of course, you know, like in Italy in, in 1199, 80% of the people are saying, what's a number? But the accountants and the banking regulators know, and they're saying, you know, can't you see we're busy? We have only six days to add up this column of Roman numerals. Yeah. And, when, and when Fibonacci says, you know, but my way is so much faster, they say, hey, screw you. We bill by the hour. So <laughs> it, it was, well, they outlawed Hindu Arabic numerals in, in Florence, like even 100 years after <laughs> Fibonacci or more. Anyway. So that's, <clears throat> this is what we're getting at. Why, what are the, what are the Hindu Arabic numerals of uncertainty? They are SIPs. And why are they SIPs? Again, for, for those who are new, I'm going to show an example that, um, why don't you stop sharing for a second? Stop my screen just for a sec. Uh, so, sorry, Sam. I don't think I can. My my Chrome just uh, Google Chrome just froze. Oh, okay. Hold on. That's bad. You're gonna have to reboot. Are you not? Um, I'm I'm waiting for it to unfreeze. I think if we can, let's just keep going. Sure. No, no. But I just unshared. Yeah. I'll be able to. Yeah. Okay. But I do realize. Yes. Okay. So so I know what I want to show. 
I know what I want to show. Okay. Oops. Wait a minute. No, it. I've shared. I've shared a screen now, but it's. But people can't see it. Yeah, I'm gonna try and. Hold on, I'm gonna try and reload very quickly. Okay. Let's see if I can do anything on my end. No, I can't. I. I am sharing, and you just have to figure out how to get it into the show. Okay, I'm back. Okay, okay, there we are. Good. Okay, so so let's talk about the Hindu Arabic numerals of uncertainty. And oh, I realize I need to turn on my magnifying glass. Give me just a second here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you, I'm sure this crowd is familiar with Monte Carlo simulation. Monte Carlo simulation just means don't use one number. Use, say, 10,000 numbers. Why yeah. not? 10,000 scenarios of some yeah. future right. well, situation. Like, like if I'm rolling a die. If, if, yeah. if, I, if I'm rolling a die, let me roll it 10,000 times and not use the single average die with three and a half dots. That's all it means. So, yep. oh, and look, it makes use of Hindu Arabic numerals, which is great. Um, and so the idea of the SIP is just store the entire vector of numbers. All right. Um, I realize I, sh I should blank this row out. Uh oh, okay. Anyway, so. Um, we've got 10,000 trials. We're, we're looking at, say, 100,000 risks. God, that's a lot. Not like for a big electric utility that has 100,000 power poles. It's not mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. And we're going to run 10,000 trials. And you know what? I better, I better undo that. Hold on. Yeah. yeah. You're going to run 10,000 trials, so that's a billion computations. Now, mm -hmm. just imagine that you did that, and it took eight hours. Sure. And the boss comes in when you're done. Oh, and notice we have a SIP of total risk. That means I now have 10,000 things that my 100,000 power poles could do, given wildfire and woodpeckers pecking into the poles, I just, whatever you can think of, we've modeled it all, okay? Took me eight hours. And the boss comes in and says, you idiot, um, you put Project 23 in here. I told you to leave that one out. We're not doing that one. Okay, this is some like risk mitigation project or whatever it is, anyway. So you say, oh, no, now I have to run this for another. Now leave Project 23 out and run it for another eight hours. No. The Lego block approach says just subtract SIP 23 from your total. Mm -hmm. Right? Here. Let me run up here and see what the other one would look like. Well, sure, it's just numbers. I just subtracted it out. So instead of doing 
Instead of doing another 1 billion computations, I do 10,000 computations and I'm done and that's it. And you would be amazed how many people don't realize you can do this. Well, why? We're unsimulating Project 23. Mm -hmm. But wait a minute. I thought simulation was like virginity, a one-way street. No, <laughs> no, not with SIPs. Yeah, yeah. So, but I, th I think the point you're trying to make is that if you follow this kind of rule of simulating SIPs and doing slurps together, then you can it opens up all sorts of amazing opportunities to the to the risk professionals. Yes, by disaggregating like Lego blocks and just you re reusing, aggregating, disaggregating like numbers. Yeah. When you do a, one of those big accounting statements, big financial statements. And someone comes in and says, oh, Division A actually has one million more on profit this year. Oh, no, we have to start from scratch. Yep. and build it all the way up and account for the paper clips and the rubber bands and everything. No, you don't. Just add a million to whatever it was, right? And you mentioned the word slurp. So SIP is stochastic information packet. I have to keep driving this home to people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Slurp is, sto is stochastic library unit with relationships preserved. And the relationships preserved means, oh, yeah, all these, like, power poles live in the same forest yep. where if a wildfire comes through, it burns them all down at once or something, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so now let's go back and talk uh, talk Legoland in, in more detail. Yep. So first, let me say this. Some models are so gnarly that you can't, you cannot disaggregate them. Right? There is a continuum from aggregatable to disaggregatable. And you want to disaggregate as much as you can. And remember, according to George Box, all models are wrong some models are useful so what people tend to do is build ginormous models that cannot be disaggregated these are the sand castles they collapse under their own weight or you know the, the waves which is the reality of the world around you simply washes them away before they ever get completed the, the beauty of disaggregating into modules, Lego blocks, is you pull out a block you don't like, you put one in, and so on. So, so let me let me um, uh, define really what I mean by by the blocks. So, first of all, there are really at least four kinds of blocks that we know of today. Mm -hmm. At the bottom, you've got data science. So, for example, Enguiyo. Who I mentioned earlier, he's a co-author of this work, he works at Kaiser Permanente. And um, they have all kinds of like cyber risks coming on. And so, all right, email accounts get hacked or something. Well, what kind of losses do you get from that? That's data science to figure that out. I don't know, it could be some bimodal distribution, right? You either one thing happens and they don't get past the second firewall, or maybe there's a 20% chance they get past the second firewall, then they get into your bank account. I don't know, whatever it is, that's data science. Now, after the data science, we've got the SIP generation, which means, okay, the, the data scientist said, oh, we figured out what's going on here. There's a block of wood, it's a, it's a cube, and it's got the numbers one through six on the sides. And we've worked it out, that's what it is. <laughs> well, the SIP generator says, okay, it's a die and we'll roll it 10,000 times and store those numbers in the SIP, right? But the data scientists had to study the die first, right? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. they could have studied it and said, I mean, they make dice with 12 sides, right? Dodecahedrons or something, I don't know what the heck they are. They, they make them. 
but you know or, or maybe maybe it's not discrete at all maybe it's continuous it's a spinner and the data scientists look at this thing or whatever it is and they figure it out but part of simulation whatever you do is to simulate the trials and in the sandcastle version those trials are simulated deep in the sandcastle somewhere so that all the other parts of the sandcastle get to look at those trials but you can't change the sandcastle it's just like it's just one big monolithic thing and now in this case here's the big difference we are going to create SIP libraries from the simulations. And the SIP libraries, once created, oh, could take eight hours to create them. Like it took eight hours to add up all the mm -hmm. columns of the risk model. Yeah. But once we got them, hey, you can swap them in and out. You can do all kinds of things. In fact, in fact, as you will see, We will have SIP libraries, different SIP libraries for, oh, did you did you put in a control to try to reduce the vulnerability of your system? That's one set of SIP libraries. Did you do something else? That's another set of SIP libraries. Even if the SIP libraries take eight hours to compute each, swapping them in and out is almost instantaneous. Yep, yep. And, and I mean, I... I had just an application for, for this. Every year, the strategy team would um, forecast and uh, purchase a lot of external analysis to come up with the kind of the corporate interest rate forecast, foreign exchange interest uh, forecast, oil forecast, some of the macro parameters that are used in every single decision model throughout the year and these are updated a couple of times a year you know whenever something significant happens so it takes a little bit of effort up front to simulate those and then store them as sips and then any model created within the organization from that point on will have exactly the same application of these macro volatilities and macro parameters which is amazing well and let's parse the word same <laughs> all right Mm -hmm. Let's do your interest rates. Here's another way to do what you said that would be completely bogus. Everybody says, oh, we think we think interest rates are going to be log normal. And we're all going to use yep. the same distribution of log normal interest rates. And the mean is 3%. The standard deviation is 1%, whatever the heck it is, right? Mm -hmm. So we're now, <clears throat> every division, every part of your company, using the same distribution of interest rates. Yay. Not even close. That's like saying, sure, we're going to model interest rates <clears throat> by rolling a die. Yeah. We've all got the numbers one through six, one through six percent. Great. But every division is rolling a different die. Yep. So... Your division has a 6% interest rate when mine is a 1%. No, the SIP locks that in mm, mm, mm. within what we call the CPO's office, the chief probability officer's office. You need a CPO for this yep. very reason. It's a new concept. I mean, the chief risk officer could do it i mean yeah it usually does that yeah. the chief financial officer could do it i don't know but yeah you head, head of strategy it. could do it you, you 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 need it and one other point now that you're talking there is because once you have it and let's stick with ten thousand trials once you have it if your whole enterprise risk system is set up right people come in and say well why should i trust what you do with interest rates because i think it should be like this and they say oh great you have an alternative sip of interest rates let's plug that in and see if it makes any difference 
This is key. When it takes you, and remember, now we're up in the in, in the strategic meeting of the the C suite, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Someone says, well, "What if the interest rates do this?" Oh, well, that'll take us another eight hours of computation. It'll take two weeks to schedule the computer time. It'll da 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 da. And then that's the end. No one ever asks that question because they know that it can't be answered. However, going in within the CPO's office, there was some disagreement on interest rate. And so when the CPO is presenting to the CEO and the CFO, the CPO says, you know, there are three different interest rate models that are going around these days. We did them all. It takes a tenth of a, a second to move between interest rate scenarios, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And the CEO can then say, well, you know, I think I'll, I think I want to make sure we're safe under the worst of these, or I think that's very unlikely. I'm using my judgment. I, after all, am the CEO. I'm not going to work off some just like computer model blindly, right? But this has given me a lot of insight. So I... Well, in my experience, it was even better when we used the distribution because they, the market intelligence team had one scenario and then the strategic team had another scenario and then the production team had a third scenario. Well, we took the distribution that had all of these three scenarios and about 10,000 more scenarios that they haven't <laughs> even thought about. And we right. just like, and we just created, you know, into, turned it into a SIP and then used that for simulation whatever so why kind of why have a fight about which scenario to use or yeah. why stick with a couple of scenarios when you can just do the whole thing exactly. That's the whole idea of simulation exactly exactly and of course the sip libraries then enable us to get to the next level the chance informed dashboard and again there's an acid test to find out if you're in the chance age <laughs> or not and that is can you estimate the chances of something? So let me let me show you a chance informed dashboard. <clears throat> and then we'll work our way backwards from this. So notice that everything looks like a little Lego block. And we have sales, service, and supply chain are our three business units. And, well, actually, let, let me dig down a little more into the Lego blocks. <laughs> okay, so the fair taxonomy, which or ontology, I think is what Jack Jones calls it. Remember, this is fair. What is fair? Fair is like an accounting standard. Profit equals revenue minus cost. Although it's risk equals, you know, the frequency of events times the magnitude of an event. That's the basic unit, which all builds up. And so in reality, what I'm showing here could be linked to other files. We're going to come back to this in a minute, but I want to show you the basic fair ontology, which is, oh, you have events, events per year. And in this example, we're going to have an average of six, and they're Poisson distributed, but it could be it could be anything. And oh, we have we have both the risk we're faced with now, an inherent risk, and then we have a residual risk. If you if you spend thirty thousand bucks on controls, you can move the number of attacks from six to three, right? That's what you can do, right? Okay. And then, 
So we've got the, the number of events. It's an uncertain number. And then we have the single event loss. So for a single loss, a single event happens. I've modeled this one as a log normal, but it could be anything. And a log normal is defined in terms of, you know, 50% of the time, it's less than 150 million. 90% of the time, it's less than 250 million. That's the inherent risk. And if we spend 25 thousand bucks. Oh, no, let's make these millions, spend 25 million, then you get it down to 100 and 200. Now, in the fair ontology, these two things, in effect, get multiplied together to get to total risk. And by the way, let, let me show you here. So first of all, we're looking at the sales division, but I've got these things for the service division, right? Everything changed. I've got it for the supply chain division. Let's go back to sales, however. So now we, if you think of the basic LOF, uh, risk equals LOF times COF, you blindly think, oh, I just multiply these risks together. No. Let me show you why that doesn't work. The number of risks that I have per year, it turns out, you know, God rolls the hackers die or something. And this is how many hacks you got, right? One to six in, in a given year. And the data scientists say, well, how bad is a hack? Well, every time you get hacked, the damage comes from multiplying a spinner by a million dollars, right? So I just spun it. Oh, it was $750,000. So I roll the die. So here's the utterly wrong way to do this. I roll the die and I get five. Mm-hmm. And then I say, well, well, here's the really wrong way to do it. The really wrong way to do it, you, I mean, you get wrong and wrong. The really wrong way is, oh, on average, you have three and a half every year. And on average, that's the average die, the famous average die we always use with three and a half dots. On average, you get that many. And on average, the spinner equals 0.5. So your risk, half of three and a half, is one and three quarters, I'm guessing. And so, okay, everybody, the risk is one and three quarters. You know what that does not show me? That does not show me the case when you roll the six and you spun a one. The that happen. Well, when that happens, your risk is six, not one and three quarters. And you just completely miss it. So that's the worst thing you can do. Okay. And that, well, that's just garbage. That's just, okay. Now, the next thing you can do, believe it or not, is going to overestimate the risk. Mm hmm I, I found in my last 16 years, I found that I don't know why, but this is an observation that kind of constantly repeated itself. Internal auditors and lawyers often overestimate risk quite significantly. And I think there is good reason if they don't know what's going on, then they don't want to get caught with their pants down, so to speak. And yeah. as you and I have discussed, this opens up a wonderful area for, you know, unscrupulous insurers to insure these risks that people don't understand. And for businesses saving a lot of money, because once you discover that your risk exposure is actually much smaller than what the market is pricing in, you have a lot of possibilities and saving Absolutely. a lot of money. Absolutely. I think there's there are just huge opportunities there yep. as we standardize this procedure. So we started out by multiplying, multiplying three and a half by 0.5, and that was our risk. Okay. And that, 
that's ridiculous. Okay, the next approach tends to overestimate the risk. And so this is what we do. I say, we've heard of Monte Carlo simulation. So we're going to roll the die. And we're going to spin the spinner. So I rolled a five, everybody. And I spun the spinner. And the spinner came up 0.6. So now I take the five I rolled in the die and I multiply it times 0.6, which gives me three. So now my risk was three. Now I roll the die again and I get a four. And I spin a, a point two, and my risk is point eight. Yep. This is this seems reasonable. I don't know. Anyone want to anyone want to hazard a guess as to why this is wrong? Alex, do you even know what we've missed here? We've we've missed something very important. And by the way, but do, where do we are mean... now is where a lot of risk systems are. They're still doing it the way I just told you, which is going to overestimate the risk. Uh, do, do you mean that they estimate the same consequences for every occurrence, even though each occurrence is independent or yes. something else? Yes, yes. Hold on a second. Remember, I rolled a five. Yep. Five different five events. Five occurrences. Ind independent events. Five independent events. And I said, oh, it's 0.6 for each of those. But that's not true. Yep. If I roll, if I roll a five, I need to spin the spinner five times, five exactly. times. Yep. That is computationally difficult. But if I don't, so why is that so important? Well, if I do a single spin, a single spin has a uniform distribution. Yep. A huge amount out in the tails, but this would apply to any distribution. If I do it five times, the distribution centralizes due to the central limit theorem. I get less stuff in the tails. Yeah. Okay. Here now is, you know, where a miracle occurs. Tom Keelan and his metalog. And so the metalog is this way of really representing any distribution. And Tom and I together figured out how to represent arbitrary sums of risk events. And for example, that is being used in this very version, by the way. So if we, um, let's see, where do I have trial numbers on here? Hold on. Um, oh, no. Uh, right. So, so, so let me let me just say something here. I, I don't want to I don't want to run the trials at this point. But, but the number of events, the average risk events is six, right? But that means it could be one, it could be two, it could be eight, it could be three. Well, if yep. it's eight, if it's eight, we're using Tom Keelan's generalized metalog. And for those that are interested in this, email us because Tom and I have a paper on this and a, and it's built into the SIPMath tools, for gosh sakes. I mean, oh, I definitely should uh, put in a plug for our SIPMath tools. These are our own Monte Carlo tools developed at the nonprofit. And if I go down to log normal, so here I have a log normal risk event and I can say, Oh, do you want to sum up multiple IIDs? This is the latest, wonderful, greatest stuff. And we've built this into our tools. So what it means is we are doing this right. And it's, it's not clear to me, it's not clear to me uh, how many others are doing this right. I, 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 know, I know some risk systems are doing it wrong. Anyway, what comes out of here? <laughs> 
We're going back to Legoland. So we get a SIP library out. Oh, but wait. We actually get four SIP libraries out. Because what would happen, this is just the inherent risk in both frequency and loss magnitude. What would happen if I, if I invoked the control? Click. Oh, no, it didn't do it. Here. There it is. And everything changed, right? What, what would happen? If, so that reduced the frequency from six to three. What if I also invoked the uh, control to reduce the loss magnitude? Okay, so then every time I do this, I get a different SIP out. And that takes me back to this dashboard. I've got sales, I got service, I got supply chain. And on the right, we have the cost of our mitigations on that axis. We mm -hmm. have the, the risk on the Y axis. And of course, where you want to be is I spent no money and I had no remaining risk. This is like the residual. That's what you'd like. To, you can't get there from here. There is no way to get there. But now you can see, looking at this graph, that this point we're going to call efficient because there is no, this is like the efficient frontier, there is no point going off in that direction. There's nothing cheaper that has lower risk. This point, however, is inefficient because why would I pick that one when I can go down there and have less cost and less risk? And how do we define risk? Yeah, but just uh, for our listeners, what you're illustrating here is absolutely amazing because this is how every risk conversation should be happening. The comparison of risk exposure versus the cost to mitigate. And then you come up with, and as you will demonstrate, there are multiple good options. Maybe you can. Exactly. You want... And what do they depend on? Which the you take? individual's risk appetite. Yeah. And the corporation itself has got to come up with that internally because they won't all agree. But, but if you're on the board of directors, the board of directors needs to agree on a risk appetite for the company. That's really, exactly. that's what companies are about. Companies are about weighing risk and return. Oh, tell us the wonderful story about on Tuesday, you tell us this. On Wednesday, you tell us this. We're, we're, you remember, you, you know what I'm talking about. No, do you go I? to the board. Yeah. And the board says, well, how come on Tuesday you tell us about opportunities? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, that, yeah, that, that was, um, that was a, a, um, a sovereign fund in the Middle East where suddenly, finally, it, it clicked at the board level uh, because they were saying, why are you reporting performance on Tuesday and risks on Wednesday meetings? Shouldn't like, isn't it all part of the same story? Shouldn't we decide on whether the performance is good or bad based on how much risk we absorbed to gain that performance? And these are not independent things. You can't separate them into different narratives. It's all part of the same picture. And uh, for them, it clicked and they started doing risk-based performance reporting. This was many, many years ago, but this kind of, this was the deal. Yeah. This is what happened in 1952 when Harry Markowitz came up with modern portfolio theory. And, 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 and let me just say before I start demonstrating this model that for this to be a risk model, we're already falling into the trap. No, no, you want to have the, the opportunity model, the, the performance model to go with this. And then you add those Lego blocks together, right? And, 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 and we has talked about this. His company can invest in new technologies that are going to bring in new revenues. Yeah, but they also bring in new risks. You can't make those decisions yeah. in isolation. So um, first thing is, how are we measuring risk? 
Well, we could be measuring it in terms of the chance of exceeding. Like, you know, I'm, I'm exceeding, you know, $3 billion or something. And I could say, well, what's the chance that we exceed uh, $4 billion? Um, and then the graph changes. Much, much lower chance. Okay. Undo. And then I can run over to these. And what I've got, so here are my Lego blocks. And I can I can say, well, look, don't don't do any control at all. Avoid the the cyber attack or minimize the loss or avoid and minimize. And now notice right now we've done nothing. And the black dot mm -hmm. tells us where we are. Um, okay, let me click avoidance for sales. Click. Let me click avoidance and loss for service. Click. See the black dot? Mm -hmm. Well, yep. that is a dumb looking thing to do. Yep. <laughs> Look so at yes, all the money. Spent. That one over there, right? That one is cheaper and safer both. Yep. This is not efficient. And just to remind you one more time, this graph looks different in modern portfolio theory for Harry Markowitz's risk and return of an investment. It's just flipped upside down, by the way. I mean, I chose to do it this way, but the, you could graph this however you wanted. In, in terms of stocks, though, I just want to point something out that... So let's imagine that we're investing in stocks. And in this case, this dimension is like the increasing average return of your stock. And this is the increasing, or your, your portfolio, right? And this is the increasing risk of your portfolio. And it's swapped around, the axes are different, but okay. But let me remind you, A point anywhere along here, if I wrap string around this, is an efficient point. A point over here is inefficient. Or we would just say, you know, just plain nuts. How about a point out here, everybody? That, that would be efficient. No, that would be impossible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it would be efficient if there was anything there. Yeah, if it existed. Yeah, if it existed, it would be very efficient. And the reason I bring this up is that this is how they caught Bernie Madoff. Oh yes, yes, good point. I was actually discussing that today. Um, he he was caught because somebody tried to replicate his strategy and basically right. came to the conclusion it was impossible. Yes, <laughs> and, but they could even plot it on the graph that. People in, people in portfolio theory in, in investment finance, they know these graphs, right? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so that's probably it for today. Um, we will be publishing this a number of ways. It'll be out on our website. I don't know where we're going to... John and Ang, we and I are thinking about how to publish mm -hmm. this. We're really writing it up. Um, I do... I hope ChatGPT is helping you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love chat GPT. Oh, uh, me too. I, love I mean, it so I, much. You know, I got, I got D's in uh, three of my four years of high school English, man, chat GPT would have changed my life. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, in terms of, of it's being scary, I'm not saying we shouldn't be afraid. I'm just saying we shouldn't stick our heads in the sand, but the people yeah. who learn how to live with this are going to be the people who survive. Right. Um, now, look, uh, do visit my LinkedIn page to see some of these. Um, our, our blog page currently has something on Silicon Valley Bank at the nonprofit. Yeah, at uh, the portfolio management.org. Probability management. Oh, sorry, pro, pro, of course, probability management.org. Let, let me just uh, show that. But, it, but screen. yes. Um, 
and these things are happening fast. So we're, we're, we're updating the website to bring in the, uh, the other article as well that was written by Shane Cavanaugh. There are several things where things are swirling around and there's a lot going on these days, um, let alone our stuff from the Military Operations Research Society, which is also very exciting. So wonderful to see you all, folks. Stay in touch. Um, Thanks, Sam. See you in two weeks. And bye -bye. make sure you don't miss the next webcast. Thanks, Sam. All righty. So long. Bye, everyone.